So welcome to episode 23 of The Hard Truth About B2B E-commerce. I'm your co-host, Isaiah Bollinger, and I'm with uh, Tim. So Tim, Hi. take it away. I'm uh, Timothy Peterson, and I am a CMO for a sports tech startup, and I love working with Trellis. And let me tell you about our sponsor, uh, Punch Out To Go. They are a global B2B integration company specializing in connecting commerce business platforms with e-procurement and ERP applications. Uh, Punch Out To Go's iPass technology seamlessly links business applications to automate the flow of purchasing data. Uh, with their solution, you can immediately reduce integration complexities, for punch out catalogs, electronic purchase orders, invoices, and other B2B sales order automation documents in order to accelerate your business results. Now back to you, Isaiah. Yeah, so I'm really excited to, to bring on Colleen. Uh, I think we connected through LinkedIn, which has been a great resource for us because especially in B2B e-commerce, it's kind of this weird niche where there's not a lot of people that know it very well. But I think you might have reached out or we might have somehow connected on a post. And I was like, hey, like you, you definitely have a lot of experience when you join our podcast. So and you, you were nice enough to agree. So tell us a little bit about your, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. So love to hear kind of from your, your side, this background. Yeah, so I'm an expert in digital and e-commerce. I've been doing it um, for 20 years. Um, my first job when I finished my uh, MBA uh, was I started a, um, a startup during the first dot-com boom and uh, sold that to HP. Um, and from there, have had a lot of fun. And within the last 10 years, I've gone into uh, true hardcore uh, B2B distribution with a, um, an automotive aftermarket um, parts company as well as a uh, landscape supply um, company and found that that's where my, that's where my heart is, uh, is these days is in, in helping kind of folks get their, get their job done. So. Awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, it sounds like you kind of fell it. We were both talking about that earlier. Like you kind of fell into this. So I, I'm not, I'm just curious, um, like what, what made you in, like, you know, going from the, the high tech world and selling to HP, then now into like, you know, B2B commerce, like what made you interested in that when, Maybe you could probably be working for one of these like social media startups or something, you know. <laughs> you know, um, I, I think uh, some of these more traditional companies um, needed more help than the tech companies. Um, so it's a lot of fun to be able to go in and be the subject matter expert and also help people along. Um, you know, in, in some companies, people have been there uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and they're accustomed to, you know, dealing with the green screen or the fax machine or what have you. And yeah. um, they're, they're a little bit scared about the mobile phone um, and, and what can be done. And I really enjoy kind of, you know, you know hearing from people what they'd like a website to do, uh, features and functionality, and, um, and then helping them understand how we can help them with technology in their daily work. Yeah, awesome. I think that's a great, great uh, answer. And that's something that I really liked about it is that also, I think the industries that you work with, it's like real stuff, like, we're getting like, you know, auto parts to the, you know, uh, my friend owns an auto business, so he does repair. So obviously, he orders lots of parts to repair cars and stuff like that. So it's like, like real, like tangible stuff. Whereas, you know, like you said, if you're working for these social media, they, they don't need the help. They're, you know, there are the, the trillion dollar companies right now that are I think they're doing okay, but it's these uh, B2B companies that need some digital expertise. So hopefully we can help them today with learning uh, some new stuff. So could you tell us a little bit about, um, now that you've been doing this for a while, I, I think it's always important to start with kind of like a strategy. Um, I guess, you know, let's, to kind of simplify that, maybe let's take like a middle of the road company. Like how would you go about figuring out a strategy for, I know that's a, that's a tough question to answer in, in a short period of time, but <laughs> um, yeah. where would you kind of start? Yeah. Yeah. It's always customers first. Um, and in B2B, you have two sets of customers. Um, you have the people that you buy, that you sell to. Um, so, you know, your people that you're doing commerce with, um, but then you also have your sales force. Um, so typically um, in a B2B environment, sales is, is going to take priority over marketing. And those people, um, those people own the relationship with the customer. And so if you are rolling out an e-commerce initiative, you've got to not only have a great website, but that you know, meets your customer's needs, features, functionality, all that good stuff. But you've also got to have your sales force on board. 
Um, because if you launch a new website and your top sales guy is going into your top, top customer saying, yeah, don't, don't use that site. It's no good. Um, <laughs> you know, you're kind of, you know, the company is kind of shooting itself in the foot. Um, the other thing that, that, that makes it important to, to deal with the sales team and make sure you've done your sales force enablement um, is essentially that, you know, e-commerce automates some of the sales team's jobs. So I've seen some companies where you couldn't get a price unless you called the branch. Mm -hmm. So the branch was staffed up to be able to answer all those phone calls. Um, or do you have this? How many of these do you have in stock? Um, that's pretty easily automated. Um, but there are some tasks that the sales team does that you can't really automate. Um, and so you've got to kind of hash out with the sales team and agree with the sales team what you're going to automate, like pricing and catalog and things like that, and what you, know, you can't automate. And what you can't automate is, you know, for example, what part fits which car, um, what tool should be used for which job, and also the QA. Yeah, the orders. consulting, the consulting behind what they should be ordering, you know, they'll, we're a long ways away from AI getting to that point, maybe one day, but <laughs> I think it's further away than people think on just a basic website, you know. So. Well, and it's, it's, I mean, you can do it, but it's super expensive to get all that data and, and, um, and maintain yeah. it and so on and so forth. So it's all about, you know, keeping your customers first and doing that as you're building your strategy and then keeping your customers very close um, as you go along your, your digital transformation journey. Yeah. Well, one thing I would, uh, uh, you know, bring into this uh, conversation too, is, you know, you talked about sales versus marketing and, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of all of that. I mean, in fact, at the, uh, the startup where I'm CMO, I actually set up both sales and marketing. Uh, and it really is a very, it's a very interesting uh, conversation. You know, we're B2B, right? And it, it's, these things have shifted over the course of time that, you know, I've been in e-commerce and I've been doing things and B2C, B2B and, and you know, all, and all of the above, let's say, right? So what's, what do you think about the role of how marketing has changed for B2B e-commerce, uh, you know, in recent years, or how are the best ways to kind of tackle it? So uh, just like to get a little bit of that conversation going. Oh, sure. I mean, it, you know, it used to definitely be the salespeople um, and then marketing was making sales, sell sheets and holding events. And it's just not there anymore, especially with e-commerce, um, because in this day and age, your customers are going online and you've got to be online with, you know, paid search, banner ads, retargeting and all of that kind of good stuff. So your marketing spend needs to increase. Um, you know, another kind of huge area is this account based marketing. Is, is where you know, marketers are partnering with sales teams to put together a whole life cycle plan for key customers. Um, when they do this, we need to send them this message, you know, um, kind of how does a whole sequence of events look like for one specific um, customer? And that's where you know, marketing is becoming more, more and more important as marketing is moving away from you know, TV and radio and, and, and online, so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, the various tools that people have now and the ways in which you can market has changed, you know, so dramatically. And, and really, it's uh, we've talked about this with other guests, uh, uh, you know, on this podcast, but, but really the pace of change there has been so dramatic. I mean, when, when did mobile begin? When did social media begin? And how quickly did people really, uh, you know, adopt, you know, uh, mobile or social strategies and you know unfortunately i think uh, not quick enough right i, mean, I think that's really the always the answer is that things are always happening so you know we'll be we'll be talking more about this i think over the course of, of this podcast and uh, you know it, it's never going to stop we're going to have to keep thinking about what's next but i think you bring up some really really important points about um about this change so one of our guests recently was um kristen from from uh, magento who's obviously a very popular B2B e-commerce platform. And she was saying that she, you know, and I think it kind of falls in line with what you're saying, the biggest problem, she works with a lot of these smaller companies or mid-sized companies that are like, oh, should we, they're, they're starting to think about like, well, should we get Magento? Or they're, they're trying to figure out what they want to do. And it's a change man management process that you have to start with from a strategic and, and marketing standpoint, where like their marketing maybe was very, traditional but like you said i mean that's really moving more online people 
like my friend, he's, you know, a younger guy that runs this, you know, car business. So he's going to look online for parts and things uh, for his business and, and probably wants vendors that can make it easy for him to buy online. So I, you kind of have to like reshift your whole organization because people being on the phone, telling them prices, like it's going to be obsolete. It's just like, it already kind of is obsolete. It's just not everyone has automated that part yet. And it's, so you got to start preparing for that whole like shift in your organization. And I think that's, like you said, that's really important and probably where you need to start the conversation. Um, did you see a lot of backlash when you tried to do that? I mean, have you, I'm curious, like, uh, you know, where you've seen that go wrong. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of it is change management um, and building trust, having an executive sponsor. So as the e-commerce director or the owner of e-commerce, you can't, you know, always do everything that you need to do um, and just kind of winning hearts and minds. I mean, I've gone into some very tough meetings um, as we've been building, um, you know, e-commerce platforms at kind of mid-sized companies. And I went into one, it was a quoting group. Um, they had their own office. It was about eight guys and they all looked kind of scared. And one of them said, well, when the new site launches, are you going to lay us all off? And I said, well, no, absolutely not. I still need you to you know, review orders. I don't know anything about products. Um, I don't know anything about how to apply chemical. Um, and that was kind of a wake up call for me. That was, you know, about three months into a new role um, where I, I really ran into some of the, the real fear that people have. Um, and what, what I've always done is kind of gone back and said, you know, what do you need, um, you know, supporting the customer in terms of an e-commerce platform? What would help you? Um, and yeah. again, going back to treating them as a, as a customer and also just being super approachable. And, you know, I, I've just had people call me and say, Colleen, I'm worried about this or I'm worried about that. What are we doing here? Um, and being able to collect all of those concerns and, and address them, because I can imagine if one guy is calling me there's there's a hundred more out there that have that in their mind as well so it's yeah changing. oh absolutely yeah. yeah no that's a really great that was uh, i love how you uh you made that clear it's like you know their jobs are still there they just they, if anything they should be more efficient now instead of handling 50 quotes you can handle 200 quotes and you're worth more to the company because you can do more without having to be on the phone all the time or whatever that may be um, so I want to change gears a little bit um, and kind of talk about two, I guess we can kind of combine these two topics because I think they're both, they are very intertwined. Typically, you know, I think what we're seeing now is average company, especially in the smaller mid-size, but even the very large ones, they're like, okay, we need a new platform or we need to improve our, on our platform and we probably need an agency to help us with that because we don't have 10 developers. Like, and even we're seeing a lot of clients where they might have one developer, but he can only do, you know, front end development and they need us for the integrations mm -hmm. or he just, there's only so much he can do. So he needs us for a lot of work. So they, even companies with developers are actually, those are some of our better clients because they're more technical. You're basically, you need, you, you need to find the right platform and find, find a good agency. And I think that's where a lot of companies struggle because one, they don't know how to select platforms because they don't understand it. They don't really know what they're getting into. They do the big like show, this is what I see is they do the, uh, they get quotes and they get like a big, uh, you know, what's it called? The show and pony dance kind of thing where they're trying to win them all without necessarily asking the, the hard questions because they don't know to ask the hard questions. And then they're starting to talk to agencies and honestly, a lot of these agencies might be biased, you know, um, because they might only know one platform or obviously they want to win the deal for a certain reason. And they don't know what to look for in an agency. They just start looking at price. So I think that's what happens. They kind of just start looking at price and kind of hope to make the right decision. And I think they're often just not, don't really know what they're getting into. So I'm curious, it sounds like you've worked a lot with agencies or when you came into, I think it was Napa, you said, all they did was outsource. I'm assuming you had to deal with a lot of third parties. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah um, I, I mean, my phone used to ring off the hook. I used to get about 30 phone calls a, a week um, when, <laughs> when I was there. Um, but the, if you really, you know, if you really don't know kind of what to do, um, the, thing the thing to do would be to hire an agency to help you put together your business requirements. Um, your business requirements, meaning um, top level like um, modules for features and functionality, 
um, high level audit of you know your back end systems um, and then use that to um, build an RFP or a re um, request for a proposal for um, um, essentially for your, your technology platform because yeah. um, you need to choose your technology platform first because kind of once you get it, the cost of changing technology platforms oh, is yeah, very yeah. high. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So you want to make sure that you're not choosing someone that's biased and they, they lead you down the path of buying the wrong platform. And um, see, and I, need, I think, yeah. sorry to cut you off, but like I'm, what you said is just like, I wish everyone could just like, take a step back and listen to what Colleen said and do that because what we get, and I think this almost never happens. They come too late in the process. They've already tried to build their RFP and they've already tried to select the platform. And then they're hesitant to even, we tell them, look, you got to pay us because we don't trust, frankly, we can't really trust the requirements without us basically doing the requirements for them. So they're going to have to go through a discovery architecture process with us anyways. And what you're saying, which makes a lot of sense is do that a step before, instead of like, you know, waiting to try and get quotes from all these agencies that are going to be inaccurate because you don't even have good requirements, just pay someone. We do them for as little as four or five grand, which in the grand scheme of things is going to save you a lot of money, you know, and I'm sure there's other people out there that'll do it for a reasonable price. Get that. I totally agree. I mean, I'm, I mean, and, and uh, yeah. what I would add too is that this is sort of the uh, the role of the independent expert, the independent consultant, uh, yeah. you know, in between, uh, you know, these two, because that's certainly a role I found myself in, you know, many times over the years, because I've been on the brand side and I've been on the agency side, and you know, I've yeah. done this so many different times, and and, and, they, and that's kind of a way to just balance this out, you yeah. know, and. and I don't know. I guess that maybe maybe that's something you'd like to comment on as well, uh, Colleen. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's always best to go out and um, have independent consultants. I find, you know, when I've gone into a couple of roles, um, you know, some of the technology has been older. Uh, one uh, point of sale was actually older than I was. Um, and, and, and that was well, that's solid. good. That's and good. Was, I love that. it, and I was told it was solid as a rock. And, and for the current use, it was solid as a Did rock. Did it have a hand crank on it? <laughs> like, what, what is mean, that? Oh my God. <laughs> it, I mean, it was, it was fantastic and it worked and it had all the requirements. But the issue is, is, is if you're looking at 50 users a second, running um, a search and they're each getting back a thousand queries, I don't know that, that the system's gonna be able to respond with pricing fast enough. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. and, and sometimes it's hard when you're inside the company um, to be able to kind of deliver that message or sometimes it helps to have that external validation um, yeah. that, you know, yeah, this is something you might not run into it in the first year, um, but you know, you're, you're gonna hit it in the first three take you nine months to, to build something like that. So, you know, having that external perspective um, can, can really help, help a lot. And I think it's, I think there's a lot of value in hiring, you know, Colleen, maybe at the end of the episode, you can tell us about your little pitch to companies. I think you might be able to help them with hiring an independent uh, consultant like yourself to build requirements and help them select an agency. Some of our best clients have come that way where, they came in with like much more thorough requirements and then it was much easier to work with them. And that independent consultant could actually like judge our value a lot better because they gave the company some perspective. A lot of companies don't have like perspective on costs. So, I mean, even just the other day we get, I got one guy's like, yeah, someone quoted, you know, their, the quotes are so wildly different. I mean, if you, you know, they, they got a quote for 230 hours and the company had 430,000 products. I was like, there's no way that, like, what are they going to do for 230 hours? That, that, that was supposedly to, to implement an entirely new website and a new platform and, and design it. I'm like, 230 hours, like, that's enough time to, like, do a part of the project. Like, <laughs> not... I'll make the homepage for that. I'll just make the homepage. <laughs> yeah. Four, yeah, over 400, like just making sure that you QA and just that the data is there and that it's the site works is going to be a lot of work when you have that much product data. You know, I think people just don't realize the magnitude of some of this stuff. Um, so I think having an independent consultant give them some perspective on like, hey, you know, 
you probably don't want to go with the lowest quote because of these reasons, you know, <laughs> you get what you get what you pay for sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I have always been a big fan of getting detailed quotes, um, be it, you know, by piece of feature and functionality, be it by the type of resource you're going to have and, um, yeah. you know, how much you're going to pay them. And then the other thing is, is, is what you actually get into the relationship. Um, I like to get um, a monthly retainer report. Um, understanding where I spent my hours because I'll find sometimes I'll spend more of my hours on um, you know kind of like reporting or BI and, and more or, and different and a different number of hours on CSS and HTML and so I'm using different resources at different amounts and I yeah. want to make sure that that's that I'm on top of that and if we get to a point where hey I need a new HTML developer like I know in advance it's it's not a project drops because we ran out of time so yeah. that Planning and is it's, good. it's so funny that you said that because a, lo a lot of the challenges that we have as an agency is there's project management time that goes into that reporting and we have to kind of build that into our costs because, you know, obviously to be profitable. And I think companies don't, that they don't understand the value of that sometimes. So you have to kind of understand what you're getting at. And sometimes, honestly, I tell people, maybe you're not ready for where we're at as an agency. And that's where an independent consultant can come in and say like, maybe let's go find like a smaller, leaner agency that doesn't. They're not going to have as sophisticated reporting as we do, and you just need to get something up and cheap running up. And, you know, you just have to save money. You know, so. I I agree with you. Um, when I was agency side for Toyota, I ran um, you know back back in like you know 2006. Um, I was running Bio Toyota for for five states, and um, the way we always quoted things was is we quoted projects out by number of hours per role, and then we added in um, you know a percent for risk. Um, so if we were working on a system that we built and we knew the risk would be lower, um, mm -hmm. if we were building a completely new system and integrating with new systems on the client side, then the risk would be higher. Um, yeah. and I just think overall transparency is the best way um, to go and then, you know, let the client, you know, un understand and, and make the decisions. I love that. I love that idea. I might actually have to steal that from you. Uh, we don't quite do it exactly like that, but I like the idea of like, Hey, look, like we've done this before. We know what we're doing. This is like, we feel very confident in this estimate. And then there's the times where it's like, look, like we think we can do it. We we're, we're, we're going to get it done, but it, our margin of error could be high because, you know, like uh, at Trellis, we have great, great developers and I've literally never not been able to solve a problem, but it could be really expensive, you know? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you're, it's hard to estimate something when you haven't done it before. And, I think that's another problem with uh, B2B is that they, they assume that, you know, you've just done exactly what they want before. And there's just so many of these unique use cases and these unique systems that it's going to be really hard to find someone that's integrated the 40 year old POS system with SAB Hybris or whatever, you know, uh, Magento or whatever it is. <laughs> so you, you, you pretty much have to go into that knowing there's going to be a margin of error because like no one's done that before, you know, like no one's built this integration with this like really old system. Um, but if you have experience doing something similar, that still has, you know, that's going to help and that's what you should look for, you know. Um, and and uh, I think you just started, uh, you know, talking about a topic that uh, I want to segue into a little bit too. And it's sort of the unique challenges of, you know, B2B e-commerce. So, you know, B2B and B2C, uh, there is a lot in common. I mean, we all know that there's a lot. But uh, there also is a lot that is not in common, yeah. and and one of the things that I've seen in in you know B to C in recent years, and people could disagree with me on this, is that there is sort of a commoditization of things. It's you know you get Shopify, turn switch on, and then for some businesses, you know <laughs> you can go right. You can just kind of run with that and keep incrementally updating and upgrading things. With B to B, that's not really the case yet. So you know, sort of the special flavors and the uniqueness of B2B uh, e-commerce. You want to talk about that a little bit uh, and see, you know, what you think about that? I mean, the hardest thing for me has always been to keep everything in sync. Um, so, for example, you're putting in a, a new ERP, you're putting in a new pricing system, you're going to add, um, you know, an enterprise service bus, and then you've got Hybris, and you're trying to determine when you're going to upgrade Hybris because not every release is, um, not every release is forced. And so just, you know, like, for example, I was at, I was at one company that um, all of their pricing was custom. So 200,000 items, 200,000 customers, 550 branches. 
and I, <laughs> the uh, the pricing combinations went into the millions. Um, and I've seen this, yeah. <laughs> Usually you just have one price when you're buying shoes or a handbag, right? Yeah. Um, so you, you know, you, you have that level of complexity. Um, the, other, the other thing that I've always found challenging in, in the B2B environment is that you have so many different roles on the B2B side. Um, so as you move into the larger um, companies, you might have a, a sourcing manager who's deciding what can be bought then you might have a job manager who's actually buying the stuff. You've got a different guy actually using it. And then you've got an accounting department who's paying the bills. And so when you think about marketing to that group of people and meeting that, all of the needs of those people um, might be difficult. So you know, who do you prioritize? Is it the sourcing manager who's looking for a punch out site? Um, you know, and who wants to you know, control what his people buy? Or is it the accounting manager who is making sure the bills get paid? It's, um, it's, it's, there's just a lot more complexity, um, in the, in the B2B from, from my perspective. I know I've been in situations where we've had customers that buy, you know, 10 million, um, a year, uh, sorry, 10,000 from us a month, uh, a year, and then 10 million a year. And, and the, the, the needs of those companies are completely mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. and trying to serve all of those customers online is just about impossible. So you've really got to almost prioritize your features and functionality um, by you know, your top two or three customer personas. Yeah, and one of the recommendations I have, especially if companies, you know, like you said, there's so much complexity that you could get into. And a lot of times it's, it's not realistic to afford to solve all that complexity in one project. I think that's a big reason why a lot of people fail too that we see is they like try and cram way too much into the first project and they mm-hmm. have you know, hundred grand or 200 grand. And I think it's going to solve all their requirements, but really like they should probably maybe pare that down to half or the, the most key things I liked. And I'm curious if you agree with this or not, but I think it's always helpful to think about, you know, a bottoms up approach. Um, and it seems to have worked pretty well for some of our customers in that, you know, the larger complex company or uh, the $10 million uh, order, whatever, or the, the customer, they're probably going to be like on the phone with the sales rep or like, they're going to be with a very deep relationship with someone, but those $10,000 orders, the $5,000 orders, or even the $50,000 orders, like there's a certain point we're probably not making a lot of money with them on the phone. And so we like to say like, those are usually a little bit easier to automate. Maybe you can standardize some pricing. The, The operations behind those orders might be a little bit simpler. So, and oftentimes those are 30 or 50% of their orders. So, get that automated. If you get 50% of your orders automated online and the higher volume ones aren't, I think you're in a pretty good place. So what do you, I'm just curious how you, how you think about that. I agree. Those smaller customers act a lot more like um, B2C um, than yeah. anything else. And one of the things that um, I did in uh, one role, um, kind of what, what our team decided to do was, is put a lot of our uh, customer data online. So for example, we put um, years of order history online um, and also um, uh, they were able to see all the SKUs that they had bought before um, and that enabled them to plan better um, because the smaller companies, let's just say it's one guy in a truck, he's not going to remember, you know, three weeks ago what he bought and, you know, how much of it he needs and when he's going to need it. But if he has all of that information um, in his order history, he's more likely to go back over you know, his orders for the last month and reorder. Mm-hmm. And so we thought we saw that as a as a really big deal and a big help. So we we saw um, more orders, sorry, fewer orders coming in of larger um, dollar amounts, and that actually helped us be more efficient. Mm, that's really interesting. Wow. Well, yeah, it sounds uh, it sounds like you've uh, you've solved a lot of these problems. So I'm curious. Uh, I think it's uh, from your experience, you've worked a lot with SAP Hybris, which is actually something that we haven't. I don't think we've had a guest that's been like very uh, technically up to date with that platform, uh, Tim. Unless I'm wrong, but I don't think we have. No, we've talked about yeah. it ourselves, but no one, none of our guests. Yeah, were. I'm curious. You know, we kind of talked a lot about agencies a little bit, but um, we we kind of jumped over platforms and as as you're building that requirements list, I'm just curious, what are the platforms that you're seeing that are successful? I mean, from what we've seen, SAP Hybrid seems to work really well with some of the larger companies, but I think it's 
may be difficult for smaller companies to implement it because it seems to be a little bit more expensive. But curious to hear your thoughts. It is expensive. Um, I've kind of gone through the competitive review twice for two large B2B companies. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we looked at Magento, we looked at Hybris, um, we looked at Oracle Commerce Cloud, we looked at whatever the IBM offering was at the time. And um, Hybris was always able to best address, address the complexity that we had. Um, I have, you know, having, you know, previous to 2012, I was always managing homegrown sites and had had, you know, yeah. experiences where they would just melt down, um, yeah. you know, or they would just go down or you didn't, you thought there were gremlins in your code or something. Um, and so I was, I was always um, very comfortable with Hybris. It's solid as a rock, which is a good thing, but being solid as a rock can also be a bad thing. Thing. And that means it's not quite as um, not quite as agile, um, a little bit more difficult to deal with in terms of loading content. Um, yeah. And the, the back the back end interface is just more for an engineer than it is for a marketing person. Yeah. Um, but I, I never had a bad experience with Hybris in terms of it going down or, or having major issues with with when you're at a big company, um, you know, you just don't want you you need the confidence that you know you've got a robust platform in place and i've been you know out talking to people now and it's my understanding that magento has come a long way um since you know i looked at it you know three or so years ago um, it has, so yeah. I, would, yeah. I would definitely consider them um and uh for you know for for more complex b2b uh, right now yeah, I would say that's been a big change is they, they I think they kind of uh, realized that Shopify was winning. From my perspective, I think they realized Shopify was winning that's the, the lower end of the B2C market and their opportunity was more in B2B. And they have, they have a, it's funny, they had a lot of B2B customers, but they didn't start as a B2B platform. It just kind of like happened. And then I think probably about three, four years ago, we saw them really like realize like, okay, we got to build B2B specific features and like invest in B2B. And they, the last three, four years, they've done a, done a lot of that. Are there any other that platforms that you think are um, doing really well or you, you've kind of said, hmm, this is, you know, interesting. Like maybe I wouldn't have considered them five years ago, but now, you know, I would consider them. It'd really just be Magento. Um, and I've, you know, before I implemented Hybris again, I'd have to take a hard look at it um, because of the cost and, um, you know, the, the, the agility um, yeah. of it. I'd surely look hard at, I'd surely look hard at Magento. I know there are a lot of, a lot of smaller um, ones out there, but I just haven't had a lot of exposure to them. Yeah. Yeah. A couple others that we see that seem to be doing well is, um, Insight just got by EpiServer. Insight was doing pretty well in the B2B space and they just got bought by EpiServer. So I think that, you know, the combined force of them will start to do a little bit better. And then uh, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on big commerce. I think that they're, a lot of people can't afford the total cost of ownership of Magento and, and Hybris or even an Insight EpiServer or, or Salesforce, obviously. Um, Salesforce trying to position themselves as B2B. I'm skeptical of uh, <laughs> their B2B offering, but They're trying. Um, yeah, but I'm really bullish on big commerce because they're a SaaS offering similar. Like people don't, you kind of forget about them because they're like, you, they're like kind of second fiddle to Shopify in the SaaS space, but they've got some really impressive stuff on their roadmap. So I would definitely, if on the smaller side, if you're ever involved in something, I would, I would check them out. I think it's worth uh, investigating. Um, certainly not, you know, maybe if you're doing a $20 billion uh, Napa Auto Parts <laughs> or, uh, you know, another enterprise company like that, you might might probably still want to look at Magento and Hybris. But well, I just want to pick up on one other comment there, though, sort of the decline of homegrown, you know, uh, platforms and kind of the, you know, parallel with the rise of communities, right? So, you know, there are all these communities around things like Magento, right, that, that, you know, add so much value, you know, to, to using Magento. So is there really any reason to do something that is homegrown anymore? Or what sort of business would you even recommend that they build something homegrown as opposed to just continue using something that they did, you know, five, seven, 10 years ago? 
You know, I know that Home, uh, Home Depot um, kind of manages their own um, custom, um, and of course Amazon does, but they're huge and they have the dollars. And Amazon, you know, what are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> and, and, they have that, and they have the expertise. I mean, so I, I don't really see it. I, I find using a commercial software platform to be helpful and um, to provide some relief because it's, the onus is not on, you know, me as the product owner to go figure out what the next big thing is. Um, that I need to be building into my platform, how to build it and what it should look like. Um, so there's a lot of innovation that, you know, your Magentos and your Hybrises and big commerces just kind of handle for you and you just kind of get those things out of the box. For and sure. that's, you know, I've got, a, in B2B, one has a lot of things to deal with. And if someone can take innovation, that, that level of platform innovation off, off the table, um, you know, it, it, it helps. A lot. Yeah, the average B2B company doesn't have like an innovation team like Amazon or Home Depot. So you got like you said, I mean, outsource that to a to a Magento or big commerce or hybrid. So there's obviously other platforms out there. Um, I also think what's, um, what's really valuable, I think what people often forget about the platforms, the community effects, uh, this is like the biggest thing that I found that people underestimate is, when I evaluate a platform, it's it's I, the number one thing I look at is the community around it. And is it gonna grow? Like, is it a dying community or a growing community? And the reason I look for that is because, um, can I hire people? Like, I don't wanna have to train every single person to use this platform. Do they have good documentation? Do they have good APIs? And then do they have good apps and like third party, like, you know, do I, I don't have to build every custom feature. There's probably something out there that's done something similar or built built that. I'm curious, like, have you seen that effect or, you know, how, how has that worked for you? Um, oh, that's, I mean, that's huge and it's so important. I mean, there are so many tools <clears throat> that we just spun up, um, you know, on top of Hybris. Um, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite ones is Full Story. Um, essentially, <clears throat> they do, um, you know, web sessions uh, or yeah. kind of, video recordings and we had so many customers who were not um, at one company web savvy and they would call and say, I'm having a problem with your website. Can you fix it? But they couldn't articulate the problem to us. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But if I could get, you know, their email address or, you know, the time and where they were, I could find their session and fix their issue. Um, you know, in terms of communities, one of the things that I ran into often um, at Hybris was, is that, Hybris developers are hard to find and they're expensive. Um, there were, you know, we were never, you know, kind of seeing overflowing numbers of um, applications for Hybris developer and architect jobs. And so, um, you know, that is definitely something that I would look at very, um, very critically um, as I, you know, choose my next, my next yeah. platform. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's why, um, you know, when I pitch, you know, a Magento or a Big Commerce or, or Shopify, those are the three main platforms that we, that we work with because they cover such a wide range of use cases. We typically don't need to look elsewhere. Uh, we also do a lot of work with WordPress. One of the things I pitch customers on, I'm like, if you hate us, like, I, you can literally take this, you know, Magento or Shopify or Big Commerce site, and like, there are a hundred other agencies that can take over our work and we stand by our work and we'll help you transition. If you like come to a point where you refuse to work with us, you know, we're not going to hold it against you. Cause you know, I think a lot of people don't want to be locked to like one solution. And we've had customers that have taken things out in house. And I actually see that as kind of like a, a, um, a success story for how valuable some of the stuff that we've done because they were able to like take the platform and then hire their own people and, and maintain it and, and, Kind of grow from there and like you said it, it helps to have a community around that um i think with the more enterprise the software typically the more expensive the people are going to be i think <laughs> so high risk yeah. kind of falls in line with that <laughs> i don't know i say i think i would hold it against all the clients if they left the trellis i, <laughs> I just might <laughs> i'm gonna call them up right yeah so, i mean bring them back. i do take it personally when people leave us but you know and i always check to see how they're doing because i want to like who's doing who, I, like who can do better than us? Like, what are they doing? And, and a lot of times uh, I don't think they get a better <laughs> service. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, kind of so, continuing. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just had another question. Sorry to, to sorry to talk over. It was really just about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of those folks who's done B2B and B2C and I always bring this up 
you know, it, it, for a very long time, B2C was kind of the place for innovation. You know, the, the newest, hottest things about, you know, interacting with their customers, you know, it came from B2C. Uh, I don't know if that's really the case anymore. And there are a lot of very specific and exciting things that are happening you know, specific to the B2B community. But do you still think B2B e-commerce can learn from B2C e-commerce? I, definitely, um, and definitely on the side of um, you know user experience. Um, you know, the, the two biggest things that I look at is um, you know kind of the images um, because you know when you're buying a technical product, let's say you're buying a tool or a spray head or something like that, you want to be able to pull it up, spin it around, and look at it and make sure that it's the right thing. And mm-hmm. you don't have that on a lot of B two B sites. Um, I, I think that's very important. And then the same thing with product descriptions and data. Um, so, you know, maybe it's not this gorgeous, um, you know, leather handbag, um, but it's this, you know, fantastic caliper tool and it does all of these things and it works on all of these different kinds of vehicles. Um, I, I think the, the merchandising um, is really something that, um, you know, B2B needs to continue to, to look to um, B2C for. But in the same, in the same vein of, of innovation, um, B2B has its own challenges and its own problems um, that B2C will never have. Um, an example of that is, is um, at one of the places I worked, um, we had, um, all of, uh, we had um, a lot of irrigation items and a lot of um, rotors and spray heads. They look exactly the same on the outside, but the difference is on the inside. So if I were to call and say, hey, Isaiah, this is Colleen. Can you send me a box of my spray heads? Isaiah would know, well, Colleen buys this one. Let me send this to her. But when Colleen goes on the website, she sees 20 of the same exact thing, and she doesn't know what to buy. Um, so in that case, that's where you put buy it again, um, you know, kind of as a, as a marker there. So there, there are a lot of, you know, just problems that are native to, to B2B that will never happen in B2C. So you're going to start to see, you know, more and more innovation, especially as these smaller, more specialized, um, you know, companies get into, get into online selling. Yeah, I I also think that video is, is something that B2B eventually will get more value out of even than B2C. And, And I really mean that because there's so much, it's kind of what you're saying here about the level of detail. You know, the, yeah. or, you know, the memory, right, of the a, a consumer that's assumed, you know, you need to have all kinds of different video options available, like going inside to, uh, you know, a particular product. I was having a conversation with somebody uh, in B2B a while ago, and they were pointing out that, you know, often in the creation of these products, there are phenomenal graphics and sometimes videos just to manufacture a piece. And so you can access these things simply by connecting with the right people. It's not like you have to create it all, you know, on your own. It's just that people haven't technically, you know, really been doing that. They haven't been connecting with the engineers, right, yeah. who are developing these products. And now there's great reason to, and there's a place to put it all. I, I think that's a really important point is like these how-to video guides. I think that's a great one. Like more in-depth you know product knowledge or just information about the product in video but i think that you know that's one of the core problems that we see is product is just product data as they b2b companies don't know how to manage that erps aren't really well designed for it then you put it all on the e-commerce platform but it's not really exactly a pim do you buy a separate pim so i think this is where a lot of companies struggle because they're all they have a lot of times that we see is like name skew like they have like basic operational data but not the data you would want as like a consumer or buyer and they have to kind of revamp and that's a big project <laughs> to revamp you know a hundred thousand products whatever they have yeah yeah it's not it's not small <laughs> i completely agree with that it's how, how did you guys handle that you know at the massive scale that you dealt with how, how did you handle product data or you know how did the companies that you've worked with do that so um, I will tell you, uh, when I was um, at Napa Auto Parts, I was spoiled beyond belief. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was supported by uh, two senior directors who had a team of anywhere from 50 to 75 people. We used Stevo and Step, and my feet never hit the ground. Um, they oh, had wow. one person wow. who just That's handled great. images and if I found one image missing, um, he, would, um, he would fix it by the end of the day. Um, wow. And it was, 
it was, I, I didn't, I didn't know that I was that spoiled when they just said, Colleen, you know, just let us take care of it. Um, but those, um, th those guys were fantastic. Now I've worked at other places where it's been a completely manual process to clean up data. There's been no PIM. Um, and that has been more challenging and, and, you know, kind of as people think about, you know, product data and the importance of it, um, you know, it, it's not just a back end thing. If you don't have great product data that's optimized for e-commerce, your search is going to be negatively impacted. Um, and so that's really where the business case is because the majority of people come to a site to use search and find what they're looking for. Um, but if you don't have your, your data set up, it's not normalized, um, and you don't have your search engine um, you know, properly configured, um, you're going to have issues with search and ultimately with, with selling. So, um, you know, product, product data is kind of the unsung hero. Um, Absolutely. Of, of e so can you, can you explain for people like people, I think most listeners don't even know what a PIM or Stebo is. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. Um, it's basically a place where you keep all of your product data and you apply specific rules to it. Um, and so you can update your data at any time, but those rules are always applied. So let me give you an example. Um, in one case, uh, we were uploading a new set, uh, kind of a new category um, of products. And within uh, that new category, we had 70 dif 71 different ways of saying the word black, um, different abbreviations, midnight wow. black, ebony black, light black, um, and, and you know. Wow. <laughs> So, you know, all of that gets mapped to black. Um, wow. And so that's what happens. So, you know, if you just keep your data in, you know, spreadsheets or, you know, in your e-commerce platform, and then you're adding new data, um, what happens is, is those rules don't get applied. So you may clean that black up to one, and then you got black, red, gray, whatever. But then the next time data is uploaded and you have midnight black, well, then you have that as a separate search facet if that makes sense yeah no it makes a ton of sense mm -hmm. so but i think for a lot of companies it's like a little overwhelming to implement e-commerce and the pim like when do you think you know a pim would make sense for a company like at what size or scale this is something that we uh, i always try and you know tell people like hey you know if you're trying to do both at once if you can afford it great but if you're kind of maybe on the fence, maybe start with e-commerce and, and kind of use that as like your, your, your basic PIM to start and then, you know, PIM might come second. But I'm curious to hear when you think people should be using it. It's hard to say. I mean, once you get up, definitely once you get up into the tens of thousands of SKUs, um, it also depends on, um, you know, how many branches you have in your taxonomy um, and yeah. how diverse your product set is. So, you know, if every single product you sell is different, maybe not as important because you're not going to have a lot to normalize. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you're selling screws um, and you've got 3,000 items in your screw section or your nail section, you probably need one to handle all of your, you know, your measurements and your materials and, and, and such. Yeah. And I think also when you start selling in lots of different channels, because e com is just one channel, if you're selling on Amazon and then it's like, you need maybe different product data for Amazon. And I think that's when you start to get, it gets really complex. Did you, uh, I'm just curious, did you deal with that? Did you guys sell on any of the marketplaces? Or? A little bit, um, dabbled in it, but um, just preferred to stick to our main channels that we, that we owned. So. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we're running out of time. I, I don't want to you know, keep you guys too long. Tim, do you have any more questions? And I think we, we covered well, I, most of our topics. I think this is, this is, this is a great conversation as always. You know, I, I, I have to say, I look forward to our podcast uh, every week because we always have great guests like Colleen and yeah. get to chat about stuff that we care about. And hopefully we're providing something useful, you know, out to our listeners, you know, week to week. And so, you know, I want to give you a, a big thank you, uh, Colleen, for, for being our guest today on the hard truth about B2B e-commerce. And, you know, I hope our listeners are really enjoying uh, this as much as we are. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you all too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, this was great. I, I, uh, I learned a lot. I agree. I look forward to it too, because honestly, a lot of what I've learned about B2B e-commerce has been from this podcast because 
it's so hard to learn everything. Like you said, there's so much complexity and we can't possibly be in every possible scenario. Like, you know, we obviously don't have, you know, the experience that you have with SAP Hybris and some of the scale that, that you've dealt with there. Um, I'm just kind of curious, you know, just to kind of wrap this up, what, what would you say, what do you see coming down the road and that, you know, you've seen, done this for 20 years, you've seen two decades. What do you see as like the next decade of B2B e-commerce? <laughs> 2040, 2050, you know, way out there. 2030, yeah. you know, I know it's, it's, it's impossible to predict that far out. But, I, I'm you know, just kidding. In the next few years and, you know. Well, it's, it's got to be personalization. Um, so when you, you know, log on to your, distribution, your, your, your distributor's website, it's all about you and what you bought. So a more Amazon-like personalized experience. Um, yeah. And I would also like to see AI. Now, I don't think that AI is really going to be, you know, deciding for us what we want for breakfast at any time soon. Um, but I yeah. think rules-based AI um, especially in the area of search, um, yeah. is going to be, um, huge and just continuing to remove the, the friction that's there today. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So, so you envision kind of a more personalized, like I'm in Boston. So I want my like local Boston orders. Maybe I get better shipping cause they have like a warehouse near me. Um, just kind of that personalized and they might even like know what kind of business I am type experience. It's the, the stuff that you've bought before and complementary items to that, yeah. what's new in that space. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, kind of other upsells and, and cross sells, and then maybe also discontinued products or, you yeah. know, clearance items that are relevant to you. Well, and obviously, obviously good pricing. Well, sorry, I just wanted to add good, good uh, personalized pricing, right? I think that's. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to have, I heard something new. This really is new to me. So I was talking with somebody who does fashion tech. So it's B2C. However, this is a really interesting idea, I thought. What they do is now, when you sign into your account, you can set up as many profiles as you like. And when you, when you sign in, it mm -hmm. says, which profile do you want to activate? So the idea for, for fashion is that, is it apparel for you? for your spouse, for your kids, for mm -hmm. someone else, right? And then it activates wow. the profile and recommends based on the profile activated. So I'm like, oh, well, this is perfect for B2B, right? It's just such a clever uh, you know, way to handle these things. I just like your avatar, them. your online avatar for like shopping. That's there really you go. cool. <laughs> there you go. Sounds like a company, right? Like a little uh, add-on that you could have, like your your avatar extension that you add to your site. <laughs> hey, I'm just getting into all this. I, I like you know picking up things like that and wondering where else you can use it. And I could see that easily in B2B. I could see. Yeah, that. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Colleen. This was amazing. I think we're gonna have to have you back on, and I'm sure you'll have maybe uh, maybe once you've done your next uh, big project or something, you can keep us updated and. You'll have some more information for us. So, thank Sounds you so much. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you.